chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. And we'll read just a few verses starting at verse number 1. More softly, please. Philippians chapter 3, verse number 1. Are we there? Amen. Are we ready? Yes. Are y'all fired up? Y'all ready to hear the word of God? says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write these same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in as we desire to know your word, to have a fuller understanding of your truths. God, reveal yourself to us. God, allow these letters that have been written thousands of years ago to God to be alive or to be made alive to our lives, God, and to our present situation so we can understand, God, the transcendent nature of what was written. God, let it be so according to your will and by your spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christian jokes, but I was like, no. God was making me crazy. Like, why is he telling this joke? I'm like, don't believe me. <laughs> if I have a conscience about it, I'm like, y'all gonna have a conscience about it. But listen, listen. Philippians 2, Philippians 2, verse 1. I want to use for a title this morning, The Enemy Within. The yeah. Enemy Within. Yeah. At the age of 24, he became the youngest golfer to ever win and capture all four titles. Yeah. He was at the top of his golf of the golf dominated golfers, young and old, near and far. He was larger than life, a prodigy of sort. He surpassed every expectation of his peer, every expectation of golf analysts, those who came before him, those who had already paved the road, those of the likes of the Jack Nicholas. He, he had surpassed all of their expectations, and, and he did so with, 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 with grace and ease. You would watch him on the field and, 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 his, and his trademark black and burgundy shirt, and he would just gracefully just hit the ball, and everybody just marvel, who is this young, young, young guy? Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? Say his name. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. But however, as one article will write, he, this one-time legend became a decay or is now decaying. His once fame and role model to many, young and old, became the talk of shame and disappointment to the game, the public, and himself. His philandering, like his fractal relationships with key people in his lives, turned a drought, what was once started as a drought, into a drowning. If you read articles on the fall of Tiger Woods, you'll see that he had began to to fire and shut off everybody in his life that would be uh, contrary to what he wanted. The only person that could talk to him, as the article said, would be his father, who at this time was now is now deceased. But he was once at the top of his game, and if many of you know, who's going to stop Tiger Woods? Who's going to stop Tiger Woods? the root of his downfall. What was or who was his enemy? Y'all already know where I'm going. If y'all know where I'm going, all right. Okay, second, second person, second person. He was one of the top collegiate players. His freshman year at Virginia Tech, he widely noticed, he was widely noticed among his peers and, no, and being noticed by the NFL already at his freshman year. He soon later became the face of the NFL while playing for the Atlanta Falcons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he went on to set multiple NFL records, three pro, pro Bowl appearances. His success, listen, his success rewarded him with a 10-year, 
$130 million contract. His success was soon meet, however, with adversity. There it all came crumbling down. After being charged for running an illegal dog fighting ring, he was soon awarded an uh, indefinite awarded a, a indefinite suspicion from the NFL. That led to the seizure of his assets to repay his debt, including including after, re after receiving $130 million from the Falcons, he had to pay back $20 million to them. That's right. What's worse, he had to face imprisonment for his dogfighting. So as with Tiger Woods, I asked you a question about Mike Vick. What was the root of his downfall? Who or what was his enemy? And y'all know where I'm going, right? It's a full letter word that starts with S, in an L, in an L, in an L. How the mind just do that? Full letter word, start with S, in an L. Come on, everybody say it. One more, one more, just for good measure. Let me give you a biblical character we can all identify with or know. He was the first king of Israel. His conquests as a king were great. He was liked by all the people and created many alliances. But his one act of disobedience started his downward trend, leading to his fall and his death. Who I'm talking about? Saul. King Saul. And again, I ask the question, what was the root of his downfall? Who or what was his enemy? Come on, say it. Saul. I don't like it when I can minister like this. I can have the option to just let go. I mean, uh, just to finish up and go home because y'all get me now. But let me go on. So as I ask these three questions about Tiger Woods, Michael Vick, and King Saul, and so many others that we can name, David, David, King David. Hmm. He started off with Bathsheba. And then from there, it all started going down. If you remember the story how his um, son, went in with his, with his with the son's stepdaughter, Amnon, and uh, what's the name called with a T? Tamar. And from that point, or because of his act, it started a downward trend. And then we see this trend here, that David could not, David could not address his son because of his own issues that he had. What was his root cause? Let me give you a word. Let me answer this question in a word, and we'll tie this back into the scripture this morning. The one word, as I read through these articles and I look at uh, Mike Vick and Tiger Woods and King Saul and so many others that we can name, so many others that we know in our own lives today, who was once up here, now they have fallen. One word that I will get to this is narcissism. Very, very strong word. Let me give you a definition for narcissism. It is excessive or erotic interest in oneself. A couple of synonyms to help you understand this. Self-love, self-admiration, self-absorption, self-bitterness. You get the pattern, right? Yeah. Self-regard. And, and I forgot to put this in my notes, but let me see if I do this from memory. Uh, uh, if you go online and you read, uh, uh, I think it's Psychology of the Day, they have a test to see if you are a narcissist. So let me do a test. Please don't raise your hand if you ask all these questions. Mm. We don't want to know you're a narcissist. Let the word of God speak to you and help you out, please. Right. Narcissism. You can know if you're, uh, again, I'm paraphrasing here because I, I didn't write it down, but you can understand where I'm going. You know you're a narcissist or you're a narcissist if you're always concerned about yourself. You can care less about others. You know you are a narcissist if you take a, I'm having a little fun here. You take a, if you, if you have a habitual habit of taking a long time to get yourself dressed. Excessive. <laughs> what, what else? Look. Take, <laughs> excessive or erotic interest in oneself. If it takes you a whole hour to put on some clothes just to go to Walmart, 
you may have a bit of narcissism going on in your life. If you love yourself, and I'm not talking about love yourself and say I'm different about myself. If you love yourself more than someone else, like I don't care about it. Look, look, as long as I'm taken care of, you may be a narcissist. In a word, in our own vernacular, the problem we had, we saw in Tiger Woods, Mike Vick, and so many others we can name, is a, a inordinate self absorption or an ordinate absorption of self. And I remember, I remember, I remember when, when um, Tiger was at the height of his fame. Like, man, nobody's going to beat him. And I remember saying to myself, the only person going to be able to beat him is himself. Me, himself. He didn't understand that there is an enemy with We are sometimes more focused on the things that are external to us and how they may attack us that we're missing or we're not focusing on what's on the inside. Are, are you feeling? All right. So, if, so if you if, if you have some some some, I'm not saying you're a narcissist. You know, I like to get dressed. I like to get myself look good when I go to work. When I put cologne on, all that stuff like that. <laughs> but but I. I, I I don't consider myself to be self-absorbed. I just like to keep it together. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like things in place. But you know if you are. You know if, if, if you are dealing with some issues where you don't want to help someone else. You don't want to give her your time. You don't want to give her your finances. You don't want to give her anything. If it ain't about you, then you are dealing with some narcissism. Right. I remember some years ago before I really got into the word of God. I think my wife um, had mentioned something along this line towards me. And, and uh, I said, yeah, I was. Yeah, I was at that point. I remember going to circle. I was going to the business, the business world, business community type world business. I remember going to circle. And in that circle was me. It was the outer circle and the inner circle. In that circle was me. The inner circle had me written in it. And I had other areas, friends, business, family, blah, 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 blah. And I remember drawing the paper that all those arrows had to point to the center. That everything, everyone, every relationship that I was, this was back maybe the early, mid, mid, mid to late 90s, early 2000s, that anything that I was doing, I had one goal in mind that it would benefit me. I don't know if you remember some of that, honey. We had some people. <laughs> <laughs> us some interesting, interesting um, things to look at as it pertains to those enemies, especially the enemy within. Let's look at our text this morning. Oh, I got you. I hope I got you, got you thinking. Got you thinking. Because while many of us, and I include myself in this, are so focused on what's around us, what's outside of us, what's external to us, how they are attacking us, we are attacking. Uh, uh, let me see if I, I, I paraphrase this. Uh, the cancer in the body, it's inside, right? And it's eating away at your, it's not what's out. You hear, my, you hear this verse, but I don't think it's in Mark 7. Uh, Jesus says in Mark, says, it's not what goes, it's, it's not it's what comes out of the mouth that defiles the man. So while we're focusing on who's who don't like us and who's after us, we're not focusing yet on what's on the inside. Our biggest enemy is with him. Paul keeps showing this. Look at verse 10. It says, finally, my brother, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write these things to you is not tedious, but it is for you. But for you, it is, look at that word. He said it's safe. What are these things? Understand this. The immediate context of Philippians, of Philippians and in Philippians 3 is salvation. Or working out your salvation. I think it's in first Philippians 2. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So the immediate context that Paul is 
writing to the Philippians while he's in jail, he said, it's not te tedious for me to write these things to you because you must be about God's business. You must become and grow to be more like Christ. And in Philippians 2, he says, look, be humble. Don't be haughty. Look out for others' interests. So he's saying all this stuff in Philippians 2. And then he goes into Philippians uh, 3, verse 1. He says, it, it, it's, it's not tedious that I take the time to talk to you guys. It is for your safety. It is for my safety. So when I was writing this out, um, my, my wife and, and uh, Dana and, and their daughter, they went to Six Flags on Friday. And um, I, they didn't get home till late. But when they didn't, I think she texted me about midnight saying, hey, we, I'm dropping off Tulsa, we're going to get something to eat. And I, I was worried. I was like, well, where's my wife at? My wife and daughter, I know you know, I my wife. I love my wife. So I was in case she going to take care of her too, but I was wife at home. Anyway, so I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep, so uh, God woke me up. And, and this, and I, don't, I don't generally do this where I'll just wait till the morning. Some people are like, no, I'll get up. If God tells me to get up right now, I'm going to get up. Typically, I'll say, no, I'm not going to get up. I'm going to go back to sleep, God. But he, I could not sleep. It, I was restless, and I ended up, so I, I just turned the light on, got my Bible, and started reading my Bible, preparing for this. And God started showing me. He said, this is not just a message to be given on a Sunday morning. I'm bringing this to your attention for a reason. There are some enemies within your community that if you don't deal with, they're going to be your demise. So it is safe, as it says in verse 1, for me to take the time to talk to you about this. Because just like many, many others, and as is myself, there may be some enemies that you're not aware about inside you that if you are not careful with those things and don't address them, they will one day be your demise. The enemy within. So he said, look at verse 2. So Paul gives us, first he gives us these three enemies that are external to us. And then he drops this bomb on the Philippians about this enemy that is within. Verse 2, he says, beware of dogs. First warning he gives to the Philippians as he writes them to say, hey, it is for your safety. He tells like, beware. Look, what it means, beware means look with your eyes and perceive the dogs that are around you. Amen. And basically what he's saying is, watch out for those jokers who are who are telling you false truths. Right. Judaizers in this in this time. I mean in, in biblical time. For us, I won't sing with nobody out, but it's that's just called different religions and some Christian pastors who are not preaching the truth of God's word. He's saying, listen, if you're going to maintain your salvation and work out, you need to be aware there are certain groups of people in our day today that is intention on bringing us down or causing us to leave the faith. This is the immediate conscience. I get more than the broader conscience. So he tells them, he says, this first, this first enemy, Philippians, this first enemy Christ messages, I want us to be aware about this morning, is that there are folks out there, televangelists, other people in other forms of religion, new age, things like that, that are telling tell you certain things are okay, but they are contrary to the truth of the gospel of Christ. That's your first enemy. Your second external enemy would be evil workers. Again, he says in verse 2, beware, perceive with the eye, family, evil workers. They, these are they who are, I like this word, he says that there are some out there that are agitators. They would just stir up strife in every little corner of the word of God that they can. If they see that prosperity is, is taken off, they will stir that up. Or they see that, oh, providence, they will stir. They are agitators. Be aware, perceive around you those evil workers, people who are just trying to stir up things in the gospel and stir up things in your life to get you away from what God has called you to. Again, the immediate context is salvation. But think broader as I'm ministering. Think broader. What's going on in your life? What course that God has?
as you want. What destiny, what purpose that you know that you have, that there may be some evil workers out there that are trying to turn you away from me. Get you off course. Get you off path. Be aware of what you perceive with the eye, but they are evil. The third thing is that, again, beware of Another old archaic term would be used is confision. Beware of confision. C O N C I S I O N. Which basically means what he's talking about here is uh, in, in context, he's talking about those who are Judaizers who say that you need to be circumcised first in order to really be a Christian. In order to really be saved, you must be talking to these Gentiles, you must be circumcised first. So Paul is telling them, listen. Beware of these folks here who, who, who are more bent on mutilating the body in order to assure your salvation. If you take that in our own vernacular today, we must be aware of those who say we must do certain rituals and things and this, that, and the other in order for us to assure our salvation. Or if the God, again, if God has a has you on a course of life or a purpose and a destiny, and certain people say, no, you can't do this like this. You need to be like this here. Beware of those who are telling you that form and rituals and rites and this, the other, this, this, that, and the other requires that you do this in order to have this success, in order to be this kind of person. What she said, uh, uh, what's, what's the, uh, what's the, name? the singer, uh, yeah, what's her name? she's not a trained singer. I saw one of her songs last week. Help me out, I'm trying to make a point. I can't remember. Black, white. No, they came. They came to. Uh, they came to minister at our church back when we were in the high school. Huh? You about Miranda. Miranda. There you go. Miranda Curtis Willis. Look up Miranda Curtis Willis on on YouTube. Beautiful voice. Familiar with her? Beautiful voice. She's not a. According to your words, she's not a trained singer. She has no formal training. Mutilators would tell you, oh, no, you can never be this unless you go through X, Y, Z. That you can never be a, 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 a successful this unless you go to college, get a degree. And we know that's not the truth. But what Paul is telling us, what I'm trying to encourage you today is beware of those people. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of those who want to who want to force you into rituals and right. But what I really want to focus on this morning is the enemy within. He goes on in verse number three. Look at this. It says, for we are the circumcision. We are the true ones who've been circumcised by God. In the heart, not in the flesh. We are, we are those who worship God in the spirit. Or another translation said, we are the ones who worship God by the spirit. We are the ones, family, that he, Paul is saying. We are the true. And he says, rejoice in Christ Jesus. And look at this last clause he says in verse 3, which I want us to focus on for the uh, balance time. Put or have no confidence in the flesh. Come on, look at your mind and say, what you see? Be careful of your flesh. I see God there. Over, it was over desire for things, mm. shoes. Mm. Yeah. That's right there. <laughs> we love that. Don't respond. Shoe, don't respond. I, said, uh, I didn't have nothing too. You had to look like, what is he about to say? Shoes. <laughs> Let me give you a definition for this flesh that's listening. When you look at this in the, in the uh, Greek, it, it, it really means self. Put no confidence in in the flesh. Understand this, that the flesh is enmity against God. It, it's, it has a proclivity to sin. It's pro the flesh will sin. I don't care how spiritual you think you are, if, that's, if that flesh is in control, that flesh is going to sin. It, 
it, look at this. It pursues its own uh, its own end, and it's it, it, it's, it's it has a, a com an ugly complex. One commentator say an ugly complex for sinful desires. Let me get a definition, uh, a, a working definition of say for for the flesh. The flesh is the old ego that is self reliant and does not delight to yield to any authority or depend on any mercy. You, you ever battle in your flesh something that you just like, I just can't control this thing. I just gotta go shopping. Gotta go. I don't know what it is. Just something just draws you, draws you to the K and G. My son's brother said, that's you, Daddy. You just draw the K and G. As a lady, I've been just Goodwill shopping. <laughs> I'm like, I've been, I was in there on lunchtime Friday to go on through Goodwill, find some stuff that I could, I would want to wear and whatnot. It's like, yeah, this is good. Yeah, maybe my flesh been uh, getting to that place. <laughs> <laughs> consider this, consider this, consider Romans seven five. <laughs> Romans seven five. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions were at work in our memory to bear fruit to death. Talking about the flesh now. Why he says put no confidence. This is why you don't put no confidence in the flesh. Romans 7, 18. In my flesh, nothing good dwells. Romans 8, 5. Those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. One more. Romans 8, 8. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul tells the Philippians, Put no confidence in the very thing that is enmity against God. Can I say to you in my own vernacular today? Put no confidence in your, in your self. The enemy within. It's your enemy because God, you are now self. I mean, you're not, you have a spirit and you have your carnal nature. Your carnal nature still want to go do its own thing, the flesh. But you now have a spirit, so you can't put confidence in your flesh. You can't put confidence in your carnal nature because it has it is enmity against God. One point I want to point out to you. He says, put, listen to this. Put no confidence in the flesh. I just described to you in various definitions and scriptures what the flesh is. When he says, put no confidence in it, do not be fully persuaded. That's what that word means. Don't just say, don't trust the flesh. No, 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 no. Because sometimes we say we trust somebody, but we can bump, uh, uh, move back from that trust, right? Yeah, I trust you. Yesterday, but I'm not trying to say. He says, do not be fully persuaded. You ever been fully persuaded about something? Yeah. Nothing's going to change your mind. You can talk to someone you respect, an elder, someone else. No, you are fully persuaded that I'm not. This is what I'm going to do. I don't care what you say about it. This is what he's saying. Do not be fully persuaded in don't have a final resolve of what your flesh wants to do because there's nothing good that dwells in your flesh. The enemy. So, let me give you this, and I'll be done here. Five things. Five. There, there, the, the, when we talk about the flesh, there are many dimensions or dynamics or aspects of the flesh that we can talk about that we should not touch. But let me just give you five things here that I want you to think about and ponder on for the next few days, next few weeks in your life. Number one, it says don't put no confidence. Do not be fully persuaded in the flesh. Here's this first dimension I call what I call dimension. Do, do, do not be fully persuaded in your heart. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jeremiah 17, 9 says the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who really knows how bad it is? You know, people. Has your heart ever led you down the wrong path? How many times when my heart just said to do it, I'm, and, and somebody says, well, no, you shouldn't do that. Don't do that. You were fully persuaded in your heart, and you, you, it was the wrong thing to do. He said the heart is deceitful. Who can know how bad it is? Mark 7, 20, Mark 7, 21 says, out of a person's heart, evil thoughts comes. Don't be, I, and next week, we'll talk about this more next week. We have to learn how to, I use the lack of a better word, balance what our heart is saying and what the Spirit of God is saying. 
Because sometimes we think the Spirit of God is saying something when it's really just our heart. The Spirit of God did not tell you that. That's your heart. Which leads me to my next point. My next thing you should not have, uh, you should not be fully, fully persuaded in, and that is your emotions. Because I didn't see some emotions just get all out of hand. I didn't see my wife was, oh, did I say my wife? She was fully persuaded in her emotions. <laughs> so after a long dialogue with me, not all the time, just a few occasions, then it came back, yeah, you're right. Because she was, my, I love my wife. You want to talk about emotional roller coaster? <laughs> my wife, I'm going to stop saying, don't let her, I love you. Don't let your husband, don't let your husband. Don't let your emotions control you. Don't be fully persuaded in your emotions because your emotions is tied to that flesh. It is your volition, your will, your choice. Word of God tells us in Proverbs 29, 11, this is a fool vents all his feelings, emotions, but a wise man holds them back. You ever just run off with the mouth? You know your emotions got the best of you. My emotions got the best of me. Don't be, don't put no confidence in me. If you're feeling a certain kind of way at a certain point in time, you better be careful. That is, that, that is not your emotions making you feel this way because you are then now causing more problems to say that way. Proverbs 15, 18 says, A wrathful man stirs up strife. Proverbs 25, 28. A man with, uh, listen to this, emotion, a man without self-control is like a city broken in two and left without walls. Man, when your emotions get the best of you, you're just all over the place. Do not, listen, as Paul says in first in verse 1 of chapter, chapter 3, it is safe, or it is for your safety that I write you. It is for your safety, our safety, that I share this with you. Don't allow your emotions. Don't be fully persuaded in your emotions. It is that enemy that lies with you. Number three, third dimension or aspect of the flesh that we should not be persuaded in. Said it simply, your mouth. Mm-hmm. James 3, 6 says, the tongue is set, is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body. Goes on to say, who can control it? How many times you just said something? You know what they say? Once it's out there, it's out there. You gotta go do some damage control. Look at the connection, family. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Don't be fully persuaded in your heart. It's deceitful. Who knows how bad it is? Don't be fully persuaded in your emotions. Don't be fully persuaded in your mouth. Your heart feels a certain way, deceitfully. It brings up your emotion wrongly, and then your mouth starts spewing out stuff that you wish you would have never said. <laughs> Why did I say to her, this will be a time when I get home this afternoon. Good Lord. Like, where daddy at? Oh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you driving around seven years because he didn't want to come home? <laughs> yeah, come on now, y'all been there. Yes. Once your heart got right or got back in tune with the spirit, your emotions got right, got back in tune with the spirit, you're like, man, why did I say that? Man, it's only 2 o'clock afternoon. You got three more hours to sit and think about it. <laughs> yeah, you're driving home. You're like, why did I say that? But oftentimes, you are met with less opposition because God is already working on the person. Proverbs 13, 18, 21 tells us, death and life, that's another verse, death and life is in the power of the tongue. Don't put no confidence in your mouth. Check what your mouth, what did they say, watch what you say, mm-hmm. think before you speak. You think? The, the enemy, that's, the, the, these are, listen, 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 these are the enemies, guys, that, that lives within us. Yeah. Our heart is, is the enemy, it's deceitful, who knows how bad it is. Our emotions sometimes can deceive us. It's, we cannot have 
We cannot put our confidence. And y'all looking like, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Come on, we've all been there. We've said and done some things based on our heart, based on our emotions, based on our mouth that we will regret saying it to this very day. Like, I wish I would have never said that. Yeah. Don't put no confidence. Don't be fully persuaded in what you think is always the right thing to say, do, or to say. Number four. Number four. Don't be po- fully persuaded in your own will. Or in, let me say it like this, in your will. Oh, I know the Lord told me to do this. Oh, the Lord told me. I, I, I heard from God. He told me to do this. And then somebody challenged you, and, and, it's a, and it's a valid challenge. Oh, no, I know that God told me to do this. No, 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 no. You need to go back and connect with the Spirit. Okay. The inability to make a judgment call. God, am I, is this my will, God, or is this your will? Don't be fully persuaded. within tighter, the enemy within might grip, the enemy within can solve. So many others that we can just name. So it's in part probably because look at me. Look at what I've done. I'm untouchable. Who's going to touch me? I remember watching um, um, I forgot the name of the show, but they did a, they did a documentary on Kwame Kilpatrick before as mayor. And now how he's sitting in prison now thought he was untouchable. Greed, I think it's American Greed, the show American Greed. He thought he was untouchable. How many mayors that we had that come through Atlanta already? Maybe even the one that we have in the office right now. I think they are untouchable. They are accomplishments. And Paul says to us as believers, in the immediate context for our salvation, in the broader context of what God has for us in our life, our purpose, our destiny, do not put any confidence in what you have accomplished in your life. Look at verse number number four. He says, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised in the eighth day. Of the stock, man, he was bad. The stock of Israel. He was a poster boy for the Jews. For, for, uh, yeah, for, the, for the Jews. Of the tribe of Benjamin. Look where I come from. I'm from family of royalty. I'm I'm, I'm a Gates. I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm this family here. My family has a name in this city here. Uh-huh. He said, no, don't put no confidence. A Hebrew of Hebrews. Man's man. When they look at the dictionary, you see a man's man, you see your picture by Because you think you're all that. <laughs> he says, uh, uh, concerning the law, a Pharisee. And you know those Pharisees, boy, they were law, 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 law. But Paul says like this, concerning zeal, Persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He had every reason in his words until God got a hold of him that I can be, I can put confidence in my flesh. Look what I've accomplished. How many of you have degrees, master's degrees, dual majors, CTO, 100 plus thousand salary. Now, you have all this confidence in yourself, or should say in your flesh. If you're not careful, it will become the same thing that will be to your demise. That's right. That's right. Amen. 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 I've heard a few stories around here. I was once up there. God knocked me down. We were living. Whatever we wanted, we got it. But somehow, it all was taken away. No, not that somehow. We became prideful. Or to say it this way, you began putting too much confidence in your flesh. And you were met with an enemy that was always on the inside and not without. While you're trying to compete against the next person or be better than the next business or do more of this, get a better job, get better education, think that's going to elevate you and elevate you and elevate you, all along you were sleeping with the enemy. What things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ. Say that again for me. All those accomplishments, everything you have done in your life, they are rubbish that you may, or consider them rubbish that you may obtain, obtain what God has for you. Yes. The 
you were once this elite business person, but now God has called you into the mission, God has called you into the social working, count it all lost that you may obtain the promise, the destiny, the purpose that God has called you to. Yeah. God, I'll be your team for you. So that begs the question, and this question will be answered next week. Then, what do we put our trust in? Naturally, the response will be God, Christ, right? Now, the response, as we all know, is safe. But how so? How do we balance our heart, emotions, our mouth, our accomplishments, our, 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 our will with, with what God wants? You're not going to live your life not thinking, not believing your heart. Your heart is going to tell you something, and you're hoping that your heart is telling you the right thing. Right. But I think God gives us some word, his word, to help us understand how to, how to use our members, the tongue, such a small member, but set of fire ablaze. God can, his spirit can help us use those things in order to glorify him. Because in verse 3, he says, rejoice in Christ. Said it differently, glory in Christ. Or in all that you do, make it to the glory of Christ. Which is why we can do that in the flesh. Amen? Amen. Father, I thank you. Father, I hope today this message has and challenge us all to look within God and not look back. Take our, our, our sights, our focus off those around us and look and see. God, challenge us to look within and to ask this question. God, are we living a life that is self-absorbed? Are we living a life, God, that is enmity against you? God, help us to see those areas of weakness in our lives give rid of, that we can be more